we are live. Welcome to 97's Air Force One Review and Thoughts. On the topic of Ukraine, I'll keep it very short. If you personally have any impact on how Ukrainian refugees will be treated, I implore for your empathy. And I do want to say right off the bat, I wasn't... I didn't choose this movie like recently I've when, when I put this movie on the schedule that was long before the invasion of Ukraine so I'm not trying to like I, I realize it could be seen as being really bad taste but yeah by the time I realized that I would be doing a video on this particular movie during the invasion the, the war it was it was too late to change the the schedule so I I, I mean no offense and we're gonna jump into right so I realize this video is long I'm gonna do what I can to make it worth your time also if you're only interested in the view that part of the video is not the whole length of the video since length check the time codes in the description box so content warning and or trigger warning Torture, kidnapping, gaslighting, xenophobia, murder, abuse, fascists and dictators, corruption. Yeah. So the yeah so the movie is rated R and so is this video and I'm just briefly gonna note that according to IMDb trivia Harrison Ford went before the MPA and appealed to have the movie re-rated to PT-13 but they refused the attempt was apparently inspired by the successful appeal to re-rate clear and present danger also starring Ford which I honestly don't remember if that movie, if it would make sense for it to be PG-13. Certainly I don't think it makes, it's not like a hard R, but I think it makes sense for this movie to be rated R. Now, before I get into anything negative, I don't hate, you know, if, if you, if you're a big fan of this movie, I don't hate you, I don't think that you necessarily, you know, hate people who do hate the movie or, you know, or that you're a bad person. If you express a point of view that isn't, uh, yeah, that, that you think I might disagree with in the comment section, all I ask is that you keep it respectful and I'll keep it respectful. If you write something hateful, whether it's directed towards me or anybody else, I'm probably just going to ignore you. Now, the vast majority of what I say in these videos, I'm not trying to make factual claims. Most of what I say is my personal opinion, and I'm not claiming that my personal opinion is any more correct than anybody else's. The only time where I claim that, there, where I'm claiming factual accuracy is like, you know, the length of the movie. And if you like a movie that I talk about not liking, that's great. I'm glad you liked it. I'm not trying to destroy your enjoyment of, you know, this movie or any movie. And see. Yeah, we don't have to like the same things. In this video, I will say some negative things about some conservatives. Now, some of what I say isn't about all conservatives. I try to describe the kind of conservative I'm talking about. And if what I describe doesn't describe you, then I'm not talking about you. I've, I've experienced some people, not as much in my like comment sections and such, but I know sometimes some conservatives take it very personally. If, you know, and, and if you are unhappy that I'm criticizing someone who technically belonged to your party, rather than defending yourself and others that it doesn't describe, 
to me and others who did criticize them, criticize them directly to them. Try to convince them to be better. And that brings us... Yeah, so I'm currently dealing with some pain in my back and neck, so... But I still have a lot to say about the movies that I watch, so I might, at least in some parts of this video, speak faster on so my back feels better. And... I'm going to criticize some real people and ideas that real people believe. Let me be very clear. I do not condone any harassment or bullying. You can express an opinion, but do not harass or bully anyone. And... Yeah, so... For those who... to You know, for some people it's very important that you don't criticize something if you're not a fan of it or if you don't have a lot of experience with it. I used to really love... 90s action movies in the 90s and early to early to mid 2000s. I don't rewatch them as much now as you know back then, but yeah, you know, as a some of my favorite 90s action movies, you know, there we go. Universal wait, is that where I could yeah, Universal Soldier you know, basically Pretty much any Jean-Claude Van Damme I could get my hands on, even though even back then I didn't think the movies were good. I still enjoyed them, and yeah, Sudden Death is easily my favorite Die Hard clone. This is still a really good Die Hard clone, and I've watched this, you know, I, I used to watch this all the time. And Harrison Ford is also, in, in the 80s and 90s, was a great action hero. Now... My making jokes of this should not necessarily be taken as me thinking the thing I'm joking about is actually bad. I seem to find it very difficult not to MST3K everything I watch. And... This video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. Most visual gets is when I sometimes act something out. So feel free to watch something visual, such as clips from this movie, in another tab. I won't mind. Now, I streamed this movie, so I didn't pay anything extra. I, I used to have a VHS copy, but if you know, if you've had a VHS copy for a very long period of time, you might realize that VHS copies don't last forever. Like, I, I have DVDs that are 20 years old that still work, but VHS tapes just, they don't, you know, eventually they stop working. Anyway, I streamed this, thus didn't pay anything extra to watch it, so anything negative I said in this video, it's not out of bitterness. I don't feel like the movie wasted my time, nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. And, and yeah, it's not that I'm upset at how it compares to other movies like it, what I was expecting, trailers and other marketing. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I say in this are fair criticisms based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. And let's see. Uh, I personally find it more interesting to talk about if the movie accomplished what it set out to do and discuss whether. It should have set out to do more or less or something different instead of talking about the movie that it isn't and isn't in tr interested in trying to be. I like to look at what are the values it's communicating. Should those be challenged or lauded? Why is it like it is? A number of movies only work on their own terms and sometimes it is well worth the effort to try to take it on their own terms. I'm not going to be criticizing this movie for not being like... Let's see, what would be... I mean, for example, you know, this is Wolfgang Peterson, who also directed Dust Bullet. I'm not going to criticize this movie for not being Dust Bullet. You know, that it's not trying to be. And just in general, I'm not trying to... Yeah. Trying to look at it as something that it isn't. 
Now, since we're still dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video, it is possible that it will touch my face as I just did. I want to show you I washed my hands since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. And I guess I should also say I, I had all three shots, and I in general follow the 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 rules for yeah. So I'm aware there there's more than one version of this movie. I watched it uncut, and I recommend if you you know if you have a chance and it's not way more expensive, go with the uncut version. I couldn't tell you exactly how many times I've watched this. Somewhere between 12 and 24, a couple dozen at least. A, a dozen, one or more dozens of times at least. And I first watched it in 1999. So, you know, when I watched it, it was the kind of thing that was seen as really good. You know, I would probably have a lower opinion of it if the first time I watched it was today. I, I try not to. I try to look at movies as when they came out, but yeah. And the most recent viewing was right before I started recording this video, so the movie is very fresh in my mind. So, the plot, the movie is about a group of terrorists who hijack the, the U.S. president's plane. What's it called? Again? Never mind. And the president's attempt to rescue everyone on board by retaking his plane. And the... Yeah, according to IMDb Trivia, the film is considered to be a diehard copycat, nicknamed Die Hard, Die Hard on, on Air Force One. This turned out to be the last of a wave of Die Hard inspired thrillers, action movies where terrorists invade a confined space and are foiled by a lone hero slash saboteur. One reason was that, by now, every conceivable multi-passenger vehicles, planes, trains, automobiles, had been tried. Okay, it said city buses, not automobiles, but I couldn't help myself. And yeah, I'm I'm just briefly gonna so so this is from Wikipedia. A joint American and Russian special forces team captured General Ivan Radek, the dictator of a rogue neo-Soviet regime in Kazakhstan that retained its nuclear weapons, threatening to start a new Cold War. I just I'm I'm impressed their their dedication to making a movie where the the Ruskies were the bad guys even after the the rather where where Soviets were the bad guys it's Russia right now is and for quite some years now have been doing awful things but the the idea that the Regardless of what Putin might hope, the the Soviet Union is not coming back. That's just not a thing that's going to happen. Now, let's see. Brings us to... Right, and so, yeah, the IMDb, more like this list, compares this to The Fugitive, the Harrison Ford one, not the TV show, which I rate a 7 out of 10. Patriot Games, 7 out of 10. Clear and Present Danger, 7 out of 10. U.S. Marshals, 6 out of 10. Enemy of the State, 7 out of 10. Hunt for Red October, 8 out of 10. The Rock, 6 out of 10. Speed, 6 out of 10. Face Off, 8 out of 10. So, yeah. The, the, it, right. And on Disney Plus, it, you know, the, the suggested section compares, yeah, has Independence Day 1, which I give a 7 out of 10. Die Hard 1, 8 out of 10. Armageddon, I give that one a 5 out of Okay. If I had to rate it again today, I'd probably be fairly close to a 1. I'm, I guess maybe a 2, because from a technical perspective, it is a well-made movie. And that's, yeah. Flight Plan, 5 out of 10. Unstoppable, 7 out of 10. Die Hard 4, 8 out of 10. So that also helps give you an idea of... where I come down on the various 90s action movies. So, about diversity, I wish there were more, you know, 
the, the people making the decisions in this movie tend to be white men, but there is some diversity and some of the, you know, uh, there, there are some female characters and one of whom is, is black who are actually, you know, very, like they, they do something incredibly important to, to help save the day. So, you know, I, I appreciate that at least. Now, Let's see the okay, yeah, so that brings us to the writing. This was written by Andrew W. Marlowe, and yeah, so he wrote, he has four TV writing credits, including episodes of the more recent Equalizer show, which he also, as I say, de developed by, okay, and he created the series Take Two, he created Castle, and he wrote two episodes of Viper, 1994, okay. Yeah, so he hasn't written a feature film movie since the year 2000 when Hollow Man, which he wrote the screenplay and story for, came out. I have to wonder if maybe that movie ruined his feature film career, or I don't know, maybe he just lost the taste for it. That movie isn't as bad as, you know, I've, I've heard people say that it's like, oh, it's absolutely terrible. The, the, the vast majority of the movie works, like, and right, he wrote End of Days, which there's definitely, yeah, the movie is what it wants to be. I don't know that it's exactly where I would have gone, but it it knows what it wants to be, and it is that. Like, the, the depiction of, of the devil was played by Gabriel Byrne is... It's a... Yeah, it's... it's You, you really get the sense from, from right away, the, his introduction. You really get what, the, what movie it's, it wants to be, and it is exactly that. And he is credited as the sole writer of this movie, and yeah. It is legitimately hilarious how this movie tries to appeal to Cold War anxiety six years after the Soviet Union collapsed. The writer realized that obviously he can't say that these are Soviet terrorists, but Russian terrorists at, at the time didn't sound as good. Neo-Soviet terrorists. Obviously, that is just as scary as actual Cold War Soviet terrorists. And it's not at all the filmmaker's panic attempts to grasp at something that would be as effective for the movie-going audience as Cold War, Cold War fiction was. Like, the... the if the if, if the person being attacked is going to be the American president, you know, it just wouldn't be the same. Like, I mean, I... I can't help but point out, like, if the, the you know, what with January 6th, like, today, it would more likely be, like, yeah, it's, you know, ex extremist right-wingers rather than, but, but, yeah, the, the, let's see, you know, obviously, if the terrorists in the movie were to succeed, I'm not going to give away whether or not they are, and Radek was reinstated, that would be terrible, a lot of people would suffer, but this is nowhere near the threat that the actual Soviet Union posed. For what the actual plot of this movie is, it didn't need to be about Russia at all, it's only because of Cold War anxieties not ending when the Cold War ended, because anxiety is not rational. And yeah, so I'm going to quote a few fellow critics here. Andrew W. Marlowe's script gets the, the, gets the job done as well. 
Nothing award-winning. It's everything you would expect, given the story it has to tell. A couple of times it'll make you cringe, but again, look what it needs to accomplish. And... The times of the Cold War have gone a long time ago, so why chew on this subject in the very end of the 20th century? Some people seem to be aware, unaware of this fact. And Folks, this is a movie from the year 1997 AD. Anachronism of this sort belongs to the 70s and 80s, not to the 90s. The worst kind of cliches and stereotypes displayed here instantly force you to recall flicks such as Red Heat, Rocky, Four, the Bond movies that dealt with the Soviet regime, you name it. Okay, so these had the excuse of being spawned to an era of political tensions. But how about this? A script that pits the US president, WCF, against the gang of vicious Russian terrorists. Christ! I will never understand how a German director ends up being more patriotic than the most patriotic Republican hillbilly, but this really sets a new standard. And... Right, so... But yeah, the, the script largely, like, it, it accomplishes everything it needs to and wants to. You really get the sense that just, yeah, it, it knows what it wants to be. It doesn't try to be more than that. I guess I should briefly... Yeah, uh, moving on. So, plot twists. I mean, I I don't think there are too many plot twists. I wouldn't really call them bad. Some some of them strain credulity, but it's that kind of movie. I don't think there are too few, or that they're too easy to figure out for the viewer. And that brings us to direction. So once again, this was directed by Wolfgang Peterson. I haven't watched everything that he's directed, but I... Everything he's directed that I've seen, I like or even love. So right off the bat, yeah, the, I'm just briefly going to mention... Yeah, the, the ones he's directed that I haven't seen are the... 2016, okay, I'm going to try, Via Gegen die Bank, 2006, Poseidon, 2000's Perfect Storm, 95's Outbreak, 91's Shattered, 85 Enemy Mine, 77's The Consequest, 74's One of the Other, 71's I Will Kill You Both. But yeah, and, and I will admit, by now, I don't remember that many details of Troy. I could imagine that if I watched The NeverEnding Story again today, I might say that it's a it's too heavy for a movie that at least in part is meant to be able to be watched by children. But yeah, like this in the line of fire and thus boat yeah, incredibly well made, incredibly effective. I guess if I had to, I think in the line of fire, just barely inches past this one. But yeah, I, I do love this one as well. But yeah, it's especially comical that the movie is so patriotic for America when the director is German and like, 
when you go back and you know in 1981 he made you know so what the 16 16 years earlier he made a movie that tried to humanize you know not nazis don't don't humanize nazis obviously but it tried to point out not everybody fighting on the nazi side was a just you know nazi zealot some of them just they had like, it was literally illegal to not to openly not be a member of the nazi party so yeah you know he goes from that and then to making this and yeah so again quoting fellow critics not a classic like connor face off and the rock to each their own but yeah, Connor and Face Off, for sure, classic. Some of my favorite movies. Not just of the action genre, and not just of the 90s. The idea of terrorist hijacking Air Force One is creative, creatively handled. Much like the only good Michael Bay movie ever. The, the only Michael good... Bleh. I'm starting over. Much like the only good Michael Bay movie ever, The Rock... You will enjoy Air Force One as long as you're prepared for how dumb it is. Once again, I really, I, I, I can't stand Michael Bay, both for his filmmaking and for his politics, but I'm not going to go off on a rant about that. At least not in this video. One thing I've noticed that Air Force One really hammered home for me is that Wolfgang Peterson really doesn't do subtle. From the over-the-top action to the cheesy dialogue that's delivered by actors with a completely straight face, and the lengthy set pieces, everything is designed with a no, no with no nonsense thrills in mind. There's no real, uh, there's no real agenda behind the. Film. I mean, that's just. I don't think I'll ever completely understand how people can literally say, you know, oh, there's no real agenda, or it's it's not political. I mean, what you. It obviously is. It's just that it's. It's political in a way you like. It has an agenda that you support. Like, the movie starts with the president of the, of America saying, we will not negotiate with terrorists. I mean, I don't know how you can claim that that's not an agenda. Anyway. Oh yeah, it was made too late and loaded with too many archaic and fantastical views to say anything about even the Cold War, let alone the modern world. An over-the-top thriller too loosely tethered to reality to be a lesson about anything other than the limits of popcorn consumption. Wow. Pictures attempt to satisfy the aggressive fantasies of a graying white male audience is weirdly fascinating. It's something you don't see every day, a geriatric comic book. Wolfgang Peterson and writer Andrew Marlowe, apparently afraid to really make fun of any American icons, challenge us to take the story straight, no matter what. But the only thing this ponderous movie has going for it is its intentional humor. Peterson's film is a huge, loud beast of a film filled with gunfire explosions and not a few tears. It's all grounded, however, in Ford's gritted teeth performance as President Marshall. The talented cast, efficient action scenes, and his 70s disaster movie style this guy's stupid boisterous speech as well as its endless climax yeah this thriller movie was really good here's some poor Gary Oldman going close did a fantastic job in this movie but the movie's pretty intense and kept me interested in what will happen next even the plan the terrorists had to take over Air Force One was pretty clever what's great about this movie is it shows how badass a prison which is what made this movie a classic check it out you'll love it I mean, I will just very briefly say, it doesn't quite reach, like, the, the plan. I'm just going to say the following out loud, so it's not the elephant in the room. Obviously, Connor's, you know, the bad guy's plan is way more, like, intelligently and, like, like, I, I can't completely rule out that what, like, if, if, at least parts of that plan. I can't help but wonder if stuff, something like that would work in real life. Like some of it is just, anyway. 
and you know the first Die Hard. They also have a really great plan. I have to admit, I don't remember the second one. The third one also a great plan. But yeah, the the plan is is quite good in this. Wolfgang Peterson's direction is excellent. Most of the films kept tight, and the action scenes are clear and understandable, logical. And in this movie, refreshingly, actions have consequences. Yes, I. I don't think I ended up putting it in my notes, so I'll say it here before I forget. Something that's very important to the tension of the first Die Hard movie is the geography. We know where John is in relation to the the thieves and you know the the yeah, it it it's an you can you can really tell when he's close to being out of places to to go and and ways to to you know effectively take them out and stuff like that and that's also true of this you know fairly early on we get a good sense of what the plane's layout is and the rest of the movie is built around you know like one at at first the the terrorists don't know that there's someone there but you know at some point, I'm not going to give away exactly when, at some point they realize, and so it becomes this thing of them trying to force him to surrender or, you know, trap him, st stuff like that. And that doesn't work if you don't know the geography or if the geography is inconsistent, but it does use the, the you know, I mean, it's a plane. It's a plane in the air. There's no, nobody can enter or leave. It is literally completely, it, it has to be the, the you know, the, the, even if not the president, the, the only people who can go around the, inside the plane, taking people out, is the, or are the people on the plane. It is strange enough, going back to critic quotes, it is strange enough in itself that a director who is himself not an American would produce a piece of thinly disguised U.S. propaganda. Who am I kidding? Not disguised at all. Naked, shaven, and equipped with big flashing arrows pointing at, pointing at it. Not the Germans are immune to the grandiose nature of the nationalism, excuse me, I mean patriotism, of course, that inspires many American films. And after all, a film that portrayed German nationalism positively are not that well received, so... What is a German director who likes a trick militaristic show-off and personality cults revolving around the local alpha male dude? Wolfgang Peterson made a gripping movie with Das Boot. It was a long flick of mostly quiet moments. A leisure examination of life aboard a boat, punctuated, punctuated with shocking moments of action. In Air Force One, Peterson's talents have been, dare I say, hijacked by Hollywood. There's no leisurely examination of anything. This is neither leisure nor examination. All the parts that might bore a 12-year-old wing on Call of Duty have been cut out of the script, and nothing is left but one recycled action scene after another, some of them already parried in an airplane, backed up by a booming score. Here's an indication of how the movie was assembled. The kind of thought that went into it. When it was released, there appeared an article in the New York Times written by an actor, whose name I now forget, playing one of the characters, whose name I don't know, an innocent conversation with Harrison Ford as the president when shots are heard from elsewhere in Air Force One as the takeover starts. As the actor described the first run through, at the sound of the gunshots, he rose to his feet and sauntered over to the window to find out what was up. He was told he'd have to jump to his feet and run to the door. Why? He asked. The Secret Service is aboard. There are security agents all over. Nobody could possibly be expecting an armed attack. A normal reaction would be to try to figure out what the noise was. He was told by the director that everyone in the scene would immediately recognize the gunshots for exactly what they were. Ford, a seasoned veteran of such attacks, told the actor tightly, they're gunshots, period. Why waste three or four flaccid seconds having the actor stroll to the door? That kind of dedication and efficiency is in evidence throughout Air Force One. Bang, bang, whoosh, zap. But yeah, he, he does a really great job directing the... I already mentioned the the geography and just yeah he you know in every scene 
the the tension is very clear. Like the movie frequently cuts from Air Force One to the or the White House where the 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 first uh, not the first lady, the vice president, the female vice president, and the I guess the various secretary, yeah, the various you know people who are involved, they're trying to figure out, you know, the the exactly how they should respond. There's some talk about like the the Twenty Fifth Amendment, for example, and it it could very easily be like really boring when it cuts to, I mean, literally politicians talking, you know, like, I mean, people didn't go to this movie to see politicians talking. People went to this movie to see president, American president gunning down Russian terrorists. So it's risky to cut to this, you know, and I've seen, you know, some people hated it. That was when one critic said it was like C-SPAN. I think it works. I, I found that, you know, it, it didn't spend too long on it. Now, there are two minutes of opening credits on black screen with rousing music playing before the first scene. And then the first scene is, you know, American forces capturing the, the dictator. And, yeah, it, you know, and, and then we go to, to the president's speech about not negotiating with terrorists. And yeah, you you get a real sense of what the movie is going to be like, you know the the. It's it's. If a movie is going to be very much about, a you know at least one good guy fighting at least one bad guy, it can be a really good idea to introduce, the good guy, the bad guy, or the thing they're fighting over, right away because that's the first thing in people you know. The, the dictator, Raddick, doesn't have a huge amount of screen time in this movie, but we're never, like, when, when they say, like, they, they say the name Raddick maybe 20 times, and usually it's accompanied by either the Americans saying, we can't release Raddick, or the Russians saying, if you don't release Raddick, we'll kill hostages, you know, that kind of thing. It's extremely important that the audience is never like, who's Radic again? What was he going to do if he's free? You know, and, and yeah, the movie understands that. And, and yeah, I'm not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad, but it fits with what came before. I quite like the ending. And let's see, there are not Deus Ex Machina or convenient writing. And yeah, I'm going to quote a fellow critic here. It felt like the writers weren't sure how to end it in the final 20 minutes. And yeah, the I'll, I'll grant that the ending is one of the, it's not the best part of the movie. They didn't really fully understand how to best like the the climax is always exciting but ultimately part of the focus of the climax was a mistake they they didn't realize what people would care most about and so they focused too much on something that yeah people tend to just yeah but you still do care, you know, it's not, I've, I've seen a lot of movies where the climax is where you stop caring once the, the especially good part of it is over. That brings us to the characters and the acting. So Harrison Ford plays President James Marshall and yeah popular president of the United States, a family man who loves his wife, Grace, and daughter, Alice, and a 
according to IMDb Trivia, John Malkovich was considered to play President James Marshall in this film since he worked with Wolfgang Peterson before on In the Line of Fire, 93, in which he played Clint Eastwood's, uh, I guess, hmm, technically, that might be a spoiler. Anyway, yeah, John Malkovich turned down the role of the president in this to be in Con Air. I love him in that and Ford here, so that was a good call. I'm I'm really glad. I I'm not sure he has played president. I think he could play a very appealing president, like Ford did in this. I do think that I'm he's one of my favorite bad guys in Con Air. Just the 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 way he talks and the the yeah, ev everything. Like, just, he's so freaking good. Anyway. And, and yeah, Harrison Ford, you know, it works as this, like, people from the right age range, you know. Yeah, he's just, he's appealing. And... Right. Um, yeah. So more IMDb trivia. Having former the uh, having prison marshal watch a video game. A Michigan football game is likely an in joke as former prison Gerald Ford went to Michigan in television news in the seventies. Frequently showed clips of him watching Michigan games. On the DVD commentary, if Harrison Ford did not want to play the lead role, then Arnold Schwarzenegger, Keanu Reeves, and Dennis Quaid would be the other choices to play the lead role. Others in considered include Tom Hanks, John Malkovich, and Tommy Lee Jones. Like, okay, I'll, I'll take those in order. I love Schwarzenegger. I especially love his, like, you know, peak Schwarzenegger movies. I don't think it would have completely worked. I, I think the moment that you try to make him a more kind of everyman, like the reason we like him in action movies is because he's he's just this giant muscle bound, like you know, he's I, I really don't think if he were to play the president in a movie, like I mean, I think I haven't watched Idiocracy, and I'm not defending its politics. But hypothetically, I think Schwarzenegger... I've, I want to say it's Thai... Wait. Uh, what's his name again? Terry. Terry Crews. I want to say that's who plays the... He's the actor who plays the president in that movie. I think Schwarzenegger could probably have played president in that movie. But this movie, like, the role is written completely differently from them. Yeah. I like Keanu Reeves, and I think he's really great in action movies. I don't think he could be completely convincing as someone that, like, a huge amount of people would vote for and consider, like, he, you know, that's, that's a guy we can trust with important decisions. I, th I think it might sound like I'm saying... I, I'm not saying... I don't think that Keanu Reeves comes across as, like, ignorant or, or something like that. I think sometimes some of his, uh, some of the things we think of as his, as typical for his acting, can come across as, as that. And it, you know, for a while he did play, he was, people did think of him as this dopey teenager who's irresponsible and such, and... Yeah. Dennis Quaid, I could kind of see that, yeah. Tom Hanks, I could see him as the president part. Has Tom Hanks done action? I'm not sure I've seen Tom Hanks do action. I, I don't know, I wouldn't offhand think that he would be that convincing in, in that aspect. But he does have the, like kind of every man appeal kind of you know yeah Tommy Lee Jones 
is probably the second best choice. Yes, uh, if if Harrison Ford had declined, I think Tommy Lee Jones would have been excellent. He's, you know, he's convincing as the kind of like kick-ass type. He's he can give a speech and really make it like, you know, the the, yeah. He he would definitely have been been able to do it. Yeah. In December 2015, Donald Trump revealed his admiration for Harrison Ford on the plane. He stood up for America. When Ford was told during a television interview of Trump's compliment, he turned to the camera and said, Donald, it was just a movie. Things like this don't happen in real life. I really like that he said that he called... he. I mean, I realize he wouldn't have said president at the time because he wasn't president at the time. Wait, wait, December... No, no. Anyway, I'm almost 100% certain that he the election... I forget exactly when, but that was like 2016. And anyway, you know, he's, he's kind of talking to him like you would a child because that's... He stood up for America. I mean, it's such a... The, the concept of this movie is something that would only ever happen in a movie. Initially, director Wolfgang Peterson was denied access to the real Air Force One. A telephone call from Harrison Ford to the White House soon changed that. Quoting fellow critics here, Allegedly, Kim Costner was supposed to be playing the president. Boy, am I glad he was too busy making The Postman for this movie. Not only did he make a great postman, but he would have made a horrible president. When you want drama, you call Costner. When you want action, you call Bruce Willis. When you want the perfect blend of drama and action, you call Harrison Ford. Think the future, for example. Don't think Star Wars. Yeah, absolutely. He's he's not very Han Solo in, in this. Harrison Ford as the President of the United States is such a perfect piece of casting that it's at once a fantasy and a joke. The joke is how perfect the fantasy is. Hard to imagine any president acting like this. Besides his character's very important title, the, he looks believable as the regular everyman forced into surreal situations to rise to heroism. While, yes, the commander-in-chief of this film has some value past military training, his present middle-aged body was not bulked up to take the punishment. He got tired, hurt, and damaged as the film went on. There are parts in the film where he would make a mistake because of that Ford made for a great reluctant hero. It's just too bad that his character seemed a bit one-dimensional. After all, it seemed like Ford was playing oh, playing over-righteous jingoism version of himself. I can hardly remember anything much about James Marshall. If anything, the first time I saw this, I thought he was playing Jack Ryan again in another Tom Clancy adaptation. That's kind of true, yeah. Yeah, it is basically, like, honestly... I don't think they wrote it with... No, yeah, they, they actually... They had planned on Kevin Costner. I have to wonder if maybe some stuff was changed about the script when Harrison Ford was, was brought on. Because it really... It, this is a Harrison Ford action movie. It's not an action movie starring Harrison Ford. This is 100%. Yeah. Gary Oldman plays Igor Korshinov, a ruthless, erratic loyalist and terrorist ringleader who leads the hijacking of Air Force One. And, yeah, he's... He's so good in this role. Like, this... Gary Oldman playing villains in the 1990s was just, like, always a good... Like... This, The Fifth Element, and Leon... I'm, you know... There, there are obviously issues with Leon. The whole, you know, this, the, the. Let's go with age difference. Let's use that relatively neutral term to be to describe the ickiness of that aspect of the movie. Gary Oldman as the villain of it is just perfect, and just yeah, he's he's so much fun. Like I think, honestly. The movie would be a lot worse off if not for like let's say that they got like the second choice or the third choice or something like 
it really would not at all have been the same movie. He he really sells the just yeah. So good at playing these just evil characters. And according to Wikipedia, Gary Oldman did not stay in character between the scenes. The director later said he told the filmmaking the filming experience it forced fun because of how comic and genial Oldman would be off screen. He also said that Oldman would suddenly return to the menacing persona like a shot. Oldman used his acting for the film to help finance finance his directorial debut, Nil by Mouth, which I know absolutely nothing about. And according to IMDb Trivia, Gary Oldman's performance earned him the nickname Scary Gary during production. However, he did not stay in character between the scenes. Wolfgang Peterson called the filming experience Air Force fun because of how comedic and genial Oldman and Harrison Ford would be off screen. He also said that Oldman would suddenly return to the menacing film persona instantly. Ford has since named Oldman as his favorite on screen nemesis. And yeah, I can understand why. And apparently, Harrison Ford and Gary Oldman are actually hitting each other during fights. Wow, that's. And yeah, quoting fellow critics here. Gary Oldman's performance as the main villain should be up there with the likes of Alan Rickman's Hans from Die Hard and John Malkovich's from In the Line of Fire. Ford is great as a diplomat, but equally as good with a gun and in a fight. But the real star of this is Gary Oldman, who plays an evil, soulless terrorist determined to get his old general freed from prison. Oldman playing it plays it like he means it, killing mercilessly, mercilessly while still appearing cold and calculated rather than insane. The writer even had the decency. Let's see. Yeah, see, he yeah, he goes on to say the writer even had the decency to have Oldman deliver lines condemning the present for bombing villages while being against terror. See, to me it reads that they're basically saying n not not that they tried to put in some like, oh, you know, we could have the, the bad guy making some good points. That is sometimes, there are movies that have the bad guy making a good point. But to me, this struck, this, this felt more like they were saying, you know, people who call out America for, for bombing villages while being against terror, they're just as bad as Korshinov, you know. And Gary Oldman, though, is pretty much a copy of Alan Rickman and Die Hard, but still is good in the film. There's definitely a strong resemblance, yes. Even though Gary Oldman is known for playing bad guys. Let's see. Oh. Oldman, uh, wow, there's several people who really couldn't stand his performance, but... Koshinov felt more fully dimensional than a standard stereotypical smug evil foreigner. Gary Oldman plays him as a realistic human, realistic human being to the hilt. He really got to shine at times. And... Yeah, Glenn Close plays Vice President Catherine Bennett. And I really appreciate that, you know, she is determined to to not make a you know a, a risky or a poor decision over the course of the, you know she really yeah it it felt like the the this kind of thing of like there's there's an awareness that if you know within the fiction of the movie if she did make a mistake then people would say see you can't have, you know, not all people, but you'd have some people saying, see, you can't let a woman have power. She's too emotional. And when they were making the movie, outside of the fiction of the movie in the real world, they felt that they, they figured if we, if, if we have the female vice president make a mistake like that, then a lot of viewers will leave saying, 
we gotta not vote for a woman because they will make an irrational decision. And... I think that does more or less cover... Yeah, I'm just really briefly gonna point out Andrew Divoff is in this as one of the the Russian terrorists. I'd just like to note that this was the same year that he played the titular Wishmaster in the movie Wishmaster. Like, you know, I, I don't think he didn't need to take this movie. You know, that that was just like the the um, what's the word? I I mean I have to figure that he just thought that was a kind of fun or cool movie to do or something, you know, but yeah. And, and, and actually, you know, like, I get for, for actual Russians and Eastern Europeans, it's probably frustrating that the lead Russian bad guy, or, yeah, the, you know, Radic is play, played by German Jürgen Prochnow, and then the, you know, the, the other main Russian bad guy is played by British Gary Oldman, but a bunch of the other Russians are played by Russians with names like Ilya Baskin, Levan, oh boy, okay, Uchanesvili, David Vadim, Andrew Divov, Ilya Volok, I guess that is them, so yeah, you know, the they actually did get people like that to, yeah, let's see. I think that is what I will get into for the characters. So. Um, let's see. Um. Yeah, so, quoting fellow critics here, talking about the acting in general. The acting is, shall I say, a little over the top. That's an understatement. But otherwise, it's quite an engrossing and gripping watch once the plot has been properly established. Certainly fairly cheesy, but also very much entertaining and somewhat amusing as well. I thought Glenn Close gave a particularly good performance as Vice President Catherine Bennett. Yeah, she she is one of the best in in this for sure. Like the the ones you especially remember are Gary Oldman, Harrison Ford, and Glenn Close. Clothes, not clothes. And yeah, the casting of the film is one of the main draws, with Harrison Ford providing his usual gritty performance, Oldman rivaling Alan Rickman's Hans Gruber. But it would be it would be nice to see other fine actors. Just as uh, William H. Macy, Paul Gilfoyle, and Xander Berkeley, given more to do. That is very true. But that was kind of a thing in, in some of the, some 90s action movies. You know, I, I love Con Air, but wow, does it have a lot of incredible actors who are just not given anything to do. So, yeah, that was... I agree that it's bad, but it's not just this movie's problem. It was, in, in general, like... You know, there's also some in Face Off, for example. I could probably think of more, but just, yeah. And... Gary Oldman looks like he was having a lot of fun with the role. Glenn Close valiantly appears to be attempting to bring the film back to some form of reality. Gary Oldman showed his character's malice perfectly, and his accent was awesome. It is it is quite a good evil Russian accent, yeah. Let's 
Wendy Crewson of the Good Son nailed her role with more grace than a first lady has actually shown in the last recallable years. So I'm guessing that was written after Trump got elected. Wait, does, are they also referring to, like, Michelle Obama? Because, for my money, she was a very compelling, like, yeah. And anyway, I, I thought Michelle Obama was, has always been very careful to appear, you know, she she's, yeah, aware that, that she could get consider, you know, an angry black woman, so she was very careful in public appearances. Really looking forward to that being a thing of the past, but afraid it's gonna be a while. And The terrorists rival those of Die Hard. Cold, stone-faced, funny, smooth, and just plain hateable. They did their job. Yeah. Absolutely. Air Force One is one great ride. What makes it work so well is the conviction that Harrison Ford and Gary Oldman bring to their roles. You can see in each actor's eyes that they stand behind what they believe in. Gary Oldman makes a perfect villain, and a very complex one at that. He is not just an average one of the known madman. He has a family, he is someone's son. Those facts make him that much more real. Harrison Ford is great as the president, he's strong, quickly at it, will do anything he can to save his family and staff from hijackers. A good ride that will keep you on the edge of your seat for two hours, just as long as you don't ask any questions. Ford has the age to play a president, but the action status to give him that fighting edge. Oldman is no stranger to hamming up his bad guys and doing iffy accents. And here turns in a so-so performance as a cartoon terrorist. The support cast is good, even though they have little to do. Glenn Close, Dean Stockwell, and all don't have much to do but talk loud, but do it well. And some big names add weight but have few lines. Every performance was completely over the top. Yeah. I, I want to briefly add to, again, I think the, this thing of, you know, him saying, I am someone's son, I have a family, I think, again, the, the it's supposed to be, like, preempting, you know, when, whenever someone is, yeah, let me start by saying, obviously, Korshunov. Is evil. The way he is depicted in this movie is not particularly realistic, but it certainly is. He is depicted as very evil. But in the real world, when you are told someone is evil, you know, one of the things you might try to go, ah, what's the word? Something you might try to use as a counter argument is saying, I mean, he's someone's son. You know, he has. He may not have, you know, he uh, let's see, he may not have a partner and ch children and such, but you know, someone had, you know, yeah, had him and raised him, you know, and I, I'm pretty sure the idea is the movie wants to try to connect, try, try to make you think of, well, if someone says that, they could be talking about Korshinov, think about how evil he was, so that it has less of an impact. Again, I, the, the fact that, yeah, you know, it, it is, it should be when, when you hear someone point out, you know, they're, they're just a human being, you know, the, yeah, that, that should inspire empathy, but the, yeah, let's see. So yeah, the, the dialogue, there are 57 entries in the IMDb quote section, and all 57 of them are great. Yeah, the dialogue, like, it is, <laughs> there's a lot of, like, a lot of the dialogue 
is someone saying this is the right thing to do or you know maybe not verbatim but saying something that you know boils down to that and it's either played as you know that's that's so true that's so patriotic or it's played as ah oh, he's you know so evil and awful he's so clearly wrong but somehow it works like it should get really tedious and repetitive and for some people it does and that makes a lot of sense but somehow it it just for me and many others does not so moving on to the cinematography now it was handled by Michael Ballhaus RIP who died in 2017 and the other movies that I've seen him DP uh, oh wait did I just copy in everything I must have done and anyway the ones I've seen that he DP'd are Gangs of New York which is excellently shot let's see okay so Wild Wild West, Bram Stoker, Dracula, and What About Bob I don't remember how they're shot but no, I mean, honestly, yeah, I can remember at least some really good shots from at least Wild Wild West and Dracula. I really don't remember what about Bob much at all. And Goodfellas, which also has some excellent cinematography. The, the camera is very dynamic when it should be. Like, it's often moving, like, panning across important elements or, like, rotating around key characters in scenes of tension or action but it's not so fast that it's exhausting to watch and during scenes that are a bit more like I, I already mentioned one of the first scenes is the speech where the president stands in front of you know dozens maybe over a hundred people and the reaction shots and the shots of him talking the the camera is very calm because it wouldn't make sense for it to be all over the place yet you know but yeah during the the you know scenes of tension action and such yeah now that brings us to the editing this was edited by Richard Francis Bruce who edited 36 different movies uh, Okay, let's see. So, yeah. Okay, he did apparently edit Fifty Shades Freed and Darker, but someone had to. I'm sure it was just a paycheck. 2016 Ben-Hur, Oblivion. Right, yeah. So he edited The Perfect Storm, which was also Wolfgang Peterson. Yeah, he edited Air Force, the, other than Air Force One, he edited The Rock and Seven. Really, really well edited. Yeah. And... Yeah, the, the editing of the, of the action scenes really well handled, like... The, the editing keeps it very easy to, to follow these fast moving scenes. And, you know, for calmer scenes, it is, it isn't like moving really fast and such. Now, at least some of the special effects, like some of it, some of the stuff is miniatures and like in a behind the scenes thing they talk about making sure that the miniature was a little dirty a little wet to make it more realistic but sadly what people more remember of the special effects in this movie is the CG and this you know this was this movie was released during the dark ages of CG when somehow some filmmakers, I guess they, I mean, they must have thought it's never going to get any better. So who cares that it's really obvious? Like CG, CG from the 90s was 
frequently very obvious. Like, some, exa some exceptions, for sure. The first Jurassic Park movie, I haven't watched the other ones, does do a good job hiding it. But so many movies from this time, they would just, they would put it front and center. And it's, yeah, this, this movie does sadly suffer some from that. So, quoting a fellow critic here, the bulk of the movie takes place above the Air Force One. No kidding, eh? And boy, do you believe it. The production designer, Williams Sandell, obviously paid attention to detail, mimicking the real presidential aircraft, small, claustrophobic, and believable. And, yeah, they use it really well. Like, every... Like, all the different parts of the plane, you know, at some point or another, someone will go there. And you'll see where they keep the food. You'll see, you know, the the place where the president just relaxes and can watch football games. And, you know, the, the cockpit, all these different places. You know, at the end of the day, they didn't actually film on an airplane. It's, it's a collection of sets. It's supposed to convince us that it's a real plane. And it does. You know, you when you're watching it, you, you can kind of forget. Oh, right. It's it's a movie. It's a, it it sets. You know, it would be ridiculous to try to film aboard a plane that's in the air. Like just the the amount of logistical issues that brings up. You know, and yeah, the movie manages to sell it. Now that brings us to yeah. So. The action is very tense and suspenseful. And, yeah, we have physical fights. We have people shooting at each other. We have... I guess that's... Yeah, I think that's all this is all I'm going to get into. And... Yeah, so, quoting fellow critics here. Hmm. Okay, never mind. I don't actually agree with what the critics did say about the, the action scenes. Yeah, the, the action scenes are very... They're, they're filmed well. The, the stunts are pretty good. It's easy to keep track of what's going on, where people are in relation to each other. And... I mean, you'd, you'd think it was too limiting, like, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a plane, there are guys with guns, and one, one guy with a gun trying to take them out. It, it seems like it shouldn't provide very many different options, and yet they managed to find, they, they managed to come up with, yeah. I, I wouldn't say that the movie ever gets boring or repetitive in, in action and such. Which is, yeah, impressive considering. And that brings us to the score. It was handled by Jerry Goldsmith, RIP. Okay, so I... Just, just to briefly give an idea of how much... How, how extensive... His career was. He has 181 credit credits within music department for movie, 63 music department for TV, 27 for music department video, 12 for short, 2 for video game, 1 for documentary. He composed for 6 shorts, 77 TV credits, and 173 movies. Wow. And, yeah. You know, I, I looked over, you know, the, the stuff you maybe especially think of him for, or at least maybe, maybe I should say the stuff that, when I looked over the list, the stuff I recognized from him was various Star Trek movies and other 90s action movies than this one. 
and yeah, so according to Wikipedia, Randy Newman was initially required to write the film score. However, Peterson considered his composition to be almost a parody and commissioned Jerry Goldsmith to write and record a more somber and patriotic score in just 12 days with assistance from Joel McNeely. After the experience, Goldsmith vowed to never again take on such a last minute task. That makes a lot of sense. Randy Newman does, I mean, am I thinking of the right person? Doesn't he, is, isn't his stuff practically parody anyway? I might be thinking of a different, but anyway. Yeah, so according to IMDb trivia, Randy Newman's score was cut late in post-production by Wolfgang Peterson for being too loud and blatty. But like copies are in circulation. After Randy Newman's score was rejected, Wolfgang Peterson hired Jerry Goldsmith to compose the replacement score. The ta task proved too daunting in the time available, so Goldsmith brought in Joel McNeely to write music for several sequences based on the themes he had already prepared for the film. And... Right. Randy Newman, you know, the his score, Wolfgang Peterson felt it was too serious to the point of being unintentionally funny. Newman later recycled some of his rejected score for Toy Story 3. Yeah. Quoting fellow critics, the score is so patriotic, the only way it could be more awesome is with Team America's America Fuck Yeah. Jim Goldsmith's score is also instantly noticeable. The soundtrack is typically reminiscent of the American National Anthem, as so inspirational it's cliched. The music was fantastic, even moving at one point. I really like the use of that very subtle hum, low hum that resembles the engine of a plane, but really is used as something to build tension before the storm. Hats off to Jerry Goldsmith for the top-notch music score. The the late Jerry Goldsmith score for this movie is a hands-down classic. Only having two weeks to score the film after Peterson rejected Randy Newman's work, Goldsmith, with the help of Joel McNeely, composed one of the most bombastic, riveting, emotional, suspenseful, and patriotic scores I've heard come out of the film world. It works perfectly with the movie. And... Yeah, it's... It's very memorable of a score. I listened to it on YouTube, here on YouTube, and it really is like you could you could sit and listen to it. Just, like if you haven't watched the movie yet, then watch the movie first. But afterwards, yeah, you can sit and just listen to it. And Yeah, so uh, I, I'm not personally particularly bothered by a low level of realism, not for a movie like this, but some people will be bothered. There are a lot of factual errors regarding the plane. You know, the IMDb goof section has details. And yeah, so. Talking about the pacing, quoting fellow critics here, the first 30 minutes of the film are the most thrilling with an engrossing opening to the extremely manic hijacking. Everything is done to build tension. The film doesn't miss a beat with it seemingly, seamlessly cutting from the plane to the ground to the White House. The characters are introduced quickly to avoid losing momentum. The writer Andrew Marlowe gives enough for viewers to relate and empathize with them. The film understandably lags after the initial action, but this is beneficial as it allows for Gary Oldman to do what he does best, be menacing. A pretty good thriller for the first 40 minutes or so. There are a few slow scenes that drag the movie down. Now the movie is an hour and 58 minutes long without any credits, two, two hours, five and a half minutes long with them I would say it's definitely, it's well worth watching at the very least once if you think that it's your kind of thing. You know, I'm not American. I've never thought that America was some sort of flawless country. But I 
can't help but get into the you know I'll 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 be critical of it as well but yeah it's just it works you know if you're willing to be you know to to lose yourself into the the just this you know jingoism yeah it it really works there there are some movies where that that just can't but yeah the worst aspect and it is a very it is not a big deal is what little the the little bit of cgi is is very just like it really for for the short bits that you see it it completely pulls you out of it until it cuts back away which thankfully usually does pretty quickly but on occasion not now when I look over like other people's criticism of it like a lot of people really hated that it wasn't realistic and thought it was too cliche I don't really they're not big deals to me but you know for some people I was most worried that it wouldn't hold up on rewatch but it absolutely did I was most looking forward to the cheese and the movie exceeded my expectations the trailers do give too much away, but they do also give you a good idea of what the movie's like. Yep, the, the trailers are absolutely awesome. I, I re-watched them right before watching the movie. Now, the... Yeah, Rotten Tomatoes gives this 78% based on 59 reviews and 66% audience score. Wow, I... Kind of would have thought that was going to be higher. Anyway, based on 250,000 ratings or more, the average critic rating was 7.10 out of 10, and only 13 of the 59 were rotten. And of the user uh, of the Rotten Tomatoes users, the average rating was 3.6 out of 5. On Metacritic, the rating the critic rating. Is 61 the user rating is 6.6 .6. and let's see. yeah when, when I checked the most recent user review was from November 26 2021 25 critic reviews 27 user reviews and on IMDb it has a 6.5 wow it really is just across the board right around there anyway there are 473 IMDb user reviews, which, considering how many, like, everybody's watched this movie, so I don't know why so few people have, good, I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating, obviously not absolutely everyone, but, like, I, I don't know a single person who's watched a lot of 90s action movies who hasn't watched this one. And... Yeah, 122 links in the IMDb external reviews section, and 75 75 of the links worked in more languages than I speak. Yeah, so 190,789 IMDb users given have given the movie a weighted average of 6.5 out of 10. 30 percent voted. 7 out of 10, 25.5, 6, and yeah. I want to very briefly talk about the level of violence in the movie. I thought they did a good job making, like, it feels somewhat realistic, you know, some, somehow for which... Obviously, it's not completely, but yeah, the the kind of wounds that people take, the the way that they get hurt, it just yeah, the the movie wasn't, it neither had too much or too little violence for what it was going for. So yeah. This is not quite capital C cinema, it is cinematic junk food. Yeah. 
I recommend this to fans of 90s action movies, people who want a jingoistic, you know, American movie. Th this movie has absolutely no extras on Disney+. Plus, But, you know, other than this, it has a bunch of other 90s action movies, so... Yeah, and other than Disney+, Plus, you can stream this on Hulu+, Plus, Amazon Prime, Google Play, Vudu, Amazon Instant Video, and iTunes. So, yeah. I rate this 8 badass president depictions out of 10. And that brings us to the spoiler section. So I'm going to put on the spoiler sign. Yeah, from here on we get into thoughts. The rest of the video contains spoilers. The rest of this video is not a review. It's a series of, well, thoughts. Some is analysis, some is MSC3, riff tracks, and other jokes. Especially jokes in the very next thoughts section. Some codes for all the sections in the description box. The section right of this is thoughts I have while watching, in chronological order. You can think of it as running commentary like tweeting or the like. The section of that is thoughts I had before watching. So. Yeah, notes taken while watching. And yeah, Jürgen Parfnow awakens to the horrifying realization that yet again he's playing a bad guy in an American movie. Thanks to the support of one of the world's greatest leaders, would you say he's your favorite president? Let them vote us down and stand on their record. I'm not 100% certain if this is just the movie being sentimental, as it is in a lot of other respects, or if when this movie was made, that statement was actually true. Certainly today, Republicans don't mind voting one thing and then claiming they voted something else. Taking a victory lap after failing to vote down something, then claiming that they voted for it and not getting sufficiently challenged on it. After several times where people would almost give away the football game to him, one of them does end up giving it away before he has time to stop him. I brought you two VIP press kits. Ren? I'm ready. Take me off the bench, coach. They do a good job establishing that everybody's tired, has lowered their guard. These are the advanced field reports from the Miami field agents. Take a look at them. And then he shoots all three of them with a silenced pistol. I know we're supposed to think that it's because he is the mole, which obviously he is, but it's actually because he just remembered there's a typo in there and he really doesn't want them to see it. Without me, you have no one to fly this plane. I never think that far ahead. Mr. Ditkovich takes the controls and his face is like, I should have stayed a landlord. He does manage to get the plane back in the air, and then his face is like, I haven't been this relieved since I fixed that damn door. All new codes have been cancelled. New codes are active. I really appreciate that they addressed this. This really would have been the elephant in the room if they didn't. And I realize in the late 90s, not everybody knew about the nuclear football, but I, I would argue enough people knew. You know, and I've, I've never encounter someone who is legitimately confused about that. Like, even if they didn't know the details, they intu the, intuited? They, they picked up what's going on with that, you know. You listen to me. I don't know who you are, and I don't know what you want, but my husband has a very particular set of skills. I mean, it's not really fair to, to criticize this movie for, you know, Taken did come out after this, but yeah, it's impossible to hear a line like that and not mentally go there. The military find the pod but don't see the present. I like to imagine that the leader is trying to figure out which genre movie he's in, wondering if it could be sci-fi. Did anybody shrink the president? Maybe turn invisible. I need to know what we're dealing with here. The president takes out that one guy with the MP5, but he's in too much of a hurry to 
to, to leave there to write on the guy's shirt. Now I have a machine gun. Ho, ho, ho. Find out who killed him or you lie down next to him. Somehow I get the feeling that he doesn't need a power nap. Has he been released? I'd like five minutes of your time to tell you about a great offer. Seriously, why is it never a call like that in one of these things? I would turn my back on God himself. Oh, he's the God-fearing kind of commie, not the God-less. Am I, I feel like I might be exaggerating Gary Oldman's Russian accent. And maybe a little bit dipping into Gary Oldman as Dracula accent. Yeah, I I've watched that movie a lot of times. So that when I think Gary Oldman bad guy Eastern Europe, my mind maybe goes more to that than to this. I trace the call, sir. The call is coming from inside the plane. The president manages to take out the guy after the missile explodes into the plane. Guy's dying thoughts were, should have retired to Pacific Island, despite terrible ending of show. Okay, we got some indicator lights here, and it appears to be running on some form of electricity. Oh, right, fax machines. I kind of forgot those used to exist. That's what you do in the White House. You play God. I don't know whether he's talking about one of the populists. Maybe he's talking about Requiem, black and white. These are fun games. I don't know what his problem is. Get off my plane. Epic. There's like 18 minutes of movie, not counting the end credits, after the death of Korshnov. It's, you know, that really is what should have been the last thing to happen, the climax. I mean, I get it. They really wanted this thing of like, I mean, it would have been a huge downer if like right after, you know, get off my plane, then, you know, the president gets off and the plane just crashes with all these hostages aboard. They kind of did have to save a bunch of them or just would be like, oh, wow, that was, was that really, was that necessary? You know, so just, yeah, the, the. If they had started on the whole, you know, getting the hostages out of there, then what's Korzhnov go going to be doing? Or, I mean, what, do they, like, does he get, like, locked in a room temporarily and he's just, like, banging on the door impotently? Like, you gotta do some, it's, yeah. Yeah, Megs are no joke. I played Red Alert. You gotta make sure you got Sam set before those things come for you. We know it's risky, but we're all out of options. Well, how are the stocks? Before you answer, keep in mind, no important political decision is made in America that doesn't take those into account. And that is it for this section. So, moving on. Some notes taken before watching. And yeah, so according to Wikipedia, Paul Atanasio was brought in as script doctor to work on the film. Prior to shooting, scenes explaining Agent Gibbs' motivation for being a mole were cut from the final script. According to director Wolfgang Peterson, Gibbs was a former CIA agent who lost a lot after the end of the Cold War and thus became angry with the American government wanted revenge. He knew the terrorists from the CIA days, so they included him in their operation. The scene was considered too long to tell, and so it was cut from the film. The director also felt it was unnecessary to have in the film, so it was removed as it was irrelevant to the plot. Peterson also said in the original draft, Gibbs revealed himself at the mole early and joined the terrorists in hijacking the plane. The director felt it was more suspenseful to keep the audience guessing in the final cut, specifically pointed to the scene in which Marshall gives Gibbs a gun 
before escorting the hostages from the conference room to the parachutes in the cargo hold. I would have to agree, and I, I've, again, I've watched this movie dozens of times. I never really stopped to, I, I've, I've never felt that it was a problem for the movie that we don't know. I mean, honestly, I kind of just, I, I kind of just figured, I mean, maybe he agrees with the cause, you know, I mean, just because he's not Russian himself doesn't mean that he couldn't possibly agree with, you know, I mean, yeah, I, I, I always just figured that it was that. I kind of like that this movie presents the American president as this, like, cowboy archetype who chooses not to leave the plane to make sure that the president that, you know, supposedly the majority of the country, we don't get details, but he's the president, so he must have gotten the majority of votes. You know, I mean, his, his own survival, he risks to, to save people. I mean, I will say for sure, you know, Uh, I forget her name. I'm going to go with Vice President Close. She's clearly talented, but, you know, honestly, if America had a woman president in 1997, conservatives would lose their minds. Just look at how they reacted to the possibility of a female president. And before that, the reality of a black president. And, you know, the the I will grant the idea that you know there there are some of the American presidents had served in the military. Wait a second. Yeah yeah yeah. It's just it's some of them had yeah. So you know that aspect isn't completely out of the blue. But you know like when you talk to Americans, they'll talk about how one of the best things about America. Is how great the demo how strong the democracy is, but the action movies that they love are ones where the president is the this cowboy archetype going around using military tactics to stop terrorists. I mean, at the very least, in the line of fire and some of the you know some of the movies that have come out since this one, there are action movies where terrorists attack the president. It's like secret servicemen or, you know, it's it's not really the, the president anyway. But, yeah, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of Americans would rather vote for someone that they think of as, like, a hero, you know. I, Reagan's, part of how Reagan won was this thing of, like, you know, people liked, people felt he was appealing You know, but yeah, that that's what they prefer to a candidate who seems like the most talented, but maybe isn't as exciting. You maybe someone couldn't really imagine sitting down and having a beer with me. Don't believe me? I'm gonna quote IMDB trivia at you. Since the release of this film, entertainment magazines, websites, and commentators have conducted public polls during real presidential elections to choose the fictional movie president Americans would like to see in office. Harrison Ford as president, James Marshall has won every election. Bill Pullman as president, Thomas Whitmore on Independence Day, commonly finishes second. And he's also a badass. He's not as much and not as active, but yeah, you know, that's like, that's, yeah, it's just such a big part of the American identity to, you know, love the, the cowboy archetype and uh, yeah. And, yeah, so I'm going to quote on a co uh, comment on a couple of quotes. So the, yeah, Defense Secretary Walter Dean says, The United States does not negotiate with terrorists. It's been our bedrock principle for 25 years. The Iran-Contra scandal begs to differ. Uh, you know, that was... 
yeah, the the I, I guess eighty five I want to say so twelve yeah twelve years before this, but then that was conservatives doing something wrong. So conservatives don't like acknowledging that it happened. And you know part of the president's speech is today when I visited the Red Cross camps, overwhelmed by the flood of refugees fleeing from the horror of Kazakhstan, I realized I don't deserve to be congratulated. Your friendly reminder that it used to be seen as a good thing for American politicians to care about refugees. Only when our own national security was threatened did we act. I mean, even when this movie came out, America would invade countries and aid in coups, getting rid of democratically elected presidents to secure their access to oil. Yeah, and, and Korshinov at one point says, You who murdered 100,000 Iraqis to save a nickel on a gallon of gas are going to lecture me about the rules of war? Don't. The screenwriter graduated at the top of his class from the school of having the bad guy making a good point so as to convince, convince viewers that it's not a good point. And... <laughs> yeah, so the following is from the, the credits. Per Marshall's comment to her, the aide who helps him with the fax machine, portrayed by Masiri Freeman, is listed in the credits as future Postmaster General. <laughs> I quite like that. I mean, he said it. You know, he's he's depicted as being honest and trustworthy. Yeah, it wasn't just an it wasn't just a comment. He meant it. And. For some reason, Jürgen Prochnow, like in the movie, they call him Ivan Radic. But in the cast, he's listed as Alexander Radic. And while Gary Oldman is credited as Ivan Korshinov, he's called Igor every time his name is, like, yeah, it's, I, I really don't know how they managed to... It's not a big deal, but it is a pretty big screw-up. I, I don't know how you managed to get something that wrong. I mean, do they just think that all Russians must be called... That's Ivan or... Anyway. Oh, hey. Yeah, actually, come to think of it, the... Yeah, so the... Radic is Ivan in the movie. And Korshinov is credited as Ivan. Yeah. Anyway, according to IMDb trivia, Glenn Close was a last-minute casting decision to play Vice President Catherine Bennett for a week from her own collection during shooting because her haircut at the time was too short for the role. She only made one objection about her character in the original script. They had written a scene of her breaking down and crying, and I said, I will not do that because I thought we'd be doing women a dis disfavor if we had that cliche moment where she breaks down. Nonetheless, the character does tear up visibly when the National Security Advisor is killed while she's on the phone with the terrorists. I mean, that's not the same thing, but anyway. One of the trailers features Harrison Ford saying, I am the President of the United States, and then a smash cut to Gary Oldman punching him in the face. Because this movie was released back when conservatives still considered it wrong to punch the president in the face. It seems so quaint now. And... Okay, so I... Let's see, there's some critic. Okay, so yeah, the, the, um, yeah, quoting some fellow critics here. In this type of movie, you don't get many quirky touches. There is a kind of funny part where the president gets the idea to dump Air Force's one fuel because he sees milk curtain leaking. I don't know, maybe it doesn't sound that funny, but I get a kick out of watching Harrison Ford stare thoughtfully at the leaking milk. That's it. I'll pour milk on them. Uh, 
The director was Wolfgang Peterson two years after he did In the Line of Fire. I guess Clint's Secret Service agent character must have retired by 97, so it's a good thing we have a president who can take care of himself. Of course, Clint would have known that Xander Berkeley was a Judas and would have snapped his little legs. The whole thing never would have happened. By the way, I'm pretty sure the president keeps his tie on for the entire movie. I kept wanting him to use it to strangle somebody, but he didn't. I guess to take it off would be undignified, give comfort to America's enemies, in addition to giving comfort to America's present neck. Plus, if the transporter has a tie, so can the ass kicking president. I mean, really, the, the, you know, wear a suit. The, the, yeah. In spite of all this talk of Snipes, Stallone, Willis, I will nominate Harrison Ford as one of cinema's best film fighters. He sweats, he heaves, he stumbles. Sure, that's sort of Willis' shtick too, but Ford really looks to exert himself in a battle. Gets, yeah, gets bloodied, winded afterward. Let's see. This movie is mostly filled with bludgeoning haymakers and HK Hicklencock spray downs. A sloppy victory. Very true. So, that is the end of this video. If you have a favorite 90s action movie, you know, put it in the comments below. If there's something you think should have been different about this movie, would have made it even more awesome. Put it in the comments below. If you like this video, please comment, thumbs up, subscribe, hit the little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one or more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested view to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie, and one talking about the most recent episode of The Mandalorian that I've personally gotten to now that I've finally started watching it. And recently, the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. And, yeah, in other words, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog, as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching, as I enjoyed watching recording, and I will catch you next time.